Um, great. Thank you very much for having me, um, us, together. <laughs> um, my name is Lucy. I'm a service designer at a company called Snook. Um, we are based here in London and in Glasgow, uh, working across various sectors, doing various different projects. Um, and we're here uh, today to talk about a very special project that I ran with partner in crime here, Dan Watson of Safety Net Technologies. Uh, and we're really here to talk about um, design in practice. Um, so flipping the chat that we just had uh, this evening completely on its head and articulating to you what it means when you work with fishermen to build a service around a product. Um, so there might be a couple of fish puns. Um, we've titled it Having a Halibut Good Time because that's how much fun the project was. Um, and yeah, we're going to talk to you about the process in which we work together. Um, we're going to kind of co-host this, and I don't know how it's going to work, but I think the essence that we really wanted to get across is, at least from our perspective at Snook, that doing service design and practice means working hand in hand with your client, which is why we're trying to do, to do this together. So bear with us, um, have, have a little bit of fun, and uh, yeah, we just hope you learn some stuff by us showing us showing what we did together um, to build around Pisces. So I think what we're going to do to start is um, I'm going to introduce you to Dan, and Dan's going to introduce you to Pisces and the fishing industry, which will set the context through which this project will run. So Dan, if you want to go for it, and then we'll just, yeah, have your time. <laughs> sure. Uh, evening, everyone. Thanks for having us. Um, so yeah, a bit about what we do as a company and the context of the fishing sector. So. I set safety net technologies up about eight years ago to start looking at how you could build technology that would fit into the fishing sector to try and avoid the problem of catching the wrong fish. So it's a big problem. Um, there's lots of sort of political and regulatory approaches to it, but technology-wise, it hasn't changed a lot for the last 30, 40 years. So um, it eventually landed on this thing of light in fishing. Um, I can show you what we actually build now. Uh, it's in the squid bag. It's kind of my favorite thing. Um, the... <laughs> So it looks a bit weird, but what we do is we put lights in fishing nets. So don't, don't, don't look directly into this. It's quite bright. But um, this is basically it. We put things that change color, and they affect fish behavior, because apparently you can do UX for fish as well. So that's, that's our main thing. It's all about light and fishing. And the big thing for us has been, OK, we have this technology that we've shown works. It can do some really cool stuff. But the next big hurdle for us was the fishing sector. Great people, really hardworking, amazingly hard job that they do. And you try and take technology to that sector, and they're not the most whale coming of people. Um, that's your first one. So, you go. Yeah, I'm not going to stop. So, uh, yeah. so, so we, 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 we know it works, and we're really excited by the things that this can do, like 90% bycatch reduction in a particular fishery and all over the world. We've seen this stuff working. But then the human element comes in. Okay, how do you make it affordable, usable? Uh, sort of intuitive to use so that this will get used and not just discarded. It's another one, but it's kind of a subtle one. Um, like a lot of the fish that get thrown away. So that's where we started working with Snook through Innovate UK and a grant that they offered for design work. Um, again, a bit more about the fishing industry, just for like one minute more. Quite conservative, tend to be technology averse. You really have to prove the value of what you've got as, as in any sector um, before people will buy it. But then there's this weird twist, which is that if one person buys it in a fishery, then potentially everyone will buy it. So you, lots of behaviors that you can start to really understand and start to use in your favor when you're trying to get these things out there and used for a good cause. So I think that's all from me for now. And I've got my mic. Uh, I'm all hooked up. So together we work with fishermen, gear makers, marine electronic suppliers, ex-fishermen turned policy makers, vessel owners, and auctioneers, which are all the stakeholders in the fishing industry to shape the continued development of the Pisces product, um, which is, as Dan suggested, a piece of technology developed to help fishermen catch the right fish. Um, so this means uh, we took Pisces out in context. So my colleague Charlie and I, who was in, um, that's Charlie. She is now no longer at Snook, but still very much a part of this project. So shout out to Charlie. Um, Charlie and I took Pisces to Brixham and Newland, which are two of England's biggest fishing ports, uh, and basically uh, tested it in the context of where it would be used by the people that will use them. Um, and just a little fun fact, um, a snook is actually a type of fish, uh, which um, we can imagine one day might actually benefit from the introduction of this technology, but we'll see. 
Um, so I think this is the crux of it. These are two fishermen. They're actually brothers. Um, and the way in which we orchestrated uh, design research was by going directly to, to them. So we ran a series of research sprints over one month. Um, this was actually a relatively small project that we ran with SNTech. Um, but it meant really understanding um, what fishermen do when they're not on their boats fishing. So they go to this cafe called Tides. So Charlie and I spent a good uh, morning in Tides very early after waking up at 5 a.m. going to the auctioneer house to understand the way that fish are sold and for how much they're sold for and the fishermen's role in that process. And actually just sat there eating our breakfast listening like, which one of these guys is fishermen? And picking up on the language that they use in order for us to turn around and say, I think you're a fisherman. Do you mind if we have a small conversation with you? And it's kind of through those casual encounters that we were able to actually get to present them the, the technology and get the feedback from them. So not proposi propositioning them with anything, not demanding anything from them, but actually just having a chat over a cup of tea. And that started the whole way in which we started navigating around this industry where um, people actually want to speak to fishermen quite a lot, policymakers, um, regulators, and they're, they're pretty wary because they're like, what is this doing for me? Obviously, Brexit is quite a topical issue for the fishing industry, as many of us know. So we understood all of this by doing a little bit of research before we went out into the field to say, to think, like, how on earth are we going to speak to these people? Um, and that, and that it, it really is just about forming relationships, and I think that's probably the key thing about doing design in practice, at least from the point of view of a service designer, is just watching your surroundings and understanding how people are, what they're motivated by and what they want to do in order to introduce them to a technology that might help them, but, that, but they might be averse to. So we met these lovely brothers, they then introduced us to their friends, and so it kind of precipitated into us being well-known in... Uh, in Brixham for, oh, the girls with the light, the light thing, like, yeah, we'll talk to you. Um, and it meant, again, once ho basically hopping from uh, breakfast to lunch <laughs> and then meeting fishermen in the pub and having a beer and uh, using just the means of kind of food and beer to have these light conversations with them and get, get really kind of feedback from them in, in a very simple way. But as soon as we sat down with them, they immediately just fed into wanting to help us understand this technology. So they took my notebook, they took my pen, they started sketching, and we just let them, and we let them go, and we let them talk about it, and we let them, I think, really importantly, vent um, about the difficulties and the struggles about uh, technology adoption in this industry. Fishing, the fishing industry is extremely risk averse. Uh, basically, if they know that something works, they will do it. Uh, if you tempt them that something will help them do something better, they want to see it for themselves. So we kept hitting this barrier of like, yeah, uh, yeah, I'd probably buy it, but not until I can use it. And even if my friend uses it, well, it, that doesn't mean very much to me because I want to use it. And so when you're ad adopting and adapting a technology, um, how do you get over these barriers of resistance? Um, and, and it was very much kind of promising them that they would be co-designers within this uh, process of developing it, which is something that I think SN Tech and Dan especially um, are really kind of championing, which is what we're going to cover today as well. Um, and then we moved on to gear makers, which are um, kind of people in the system that are not necessarily at the cold front of fishing, but huge... Uh, yeah, just a, a huge stakeholder within this system because they hold kind of the keys and the networks that um, that uh, that enable this this system to work really. So that means that um, there's one or two net makers in a community. They know all of the fishermen. Um, they make the nets, hand made, make the nets for the fishermen in which this product has to attach to. So unless we spoke to them uh, and involved them in this process, we would be missing quite a big part of the puzzle. So our afternoons were spent with gear makers and, um, and actually understanding like, oh, where would this, where would this uh, actually fit on a net and how would people purchase it and things like that. So it's just these casual encounters, again, within the context in which this um, technology would be used that led to Charlie and I's building of an understanding of the market in which this product would be released and more importantly, the people that would be using it. Um, so 
This was just us testing. This was a tiny net that one of the gear makers had produced and us actually starting to figure out where this device would be placed on that. Um, I think there's a lot of intricacies within that, which maybe you can touch on, Dan, when we get to the co-design se section of this talk. But it's really just a case of, I think, design and practice actually uh, iterating and testing as you're going and as things are presented with you, like, oh, there's a little net. Like, how does that mean that we can fiddle with things and test things in the context and, and just have fun with it? And I think that's the point about this project, is that when, when you go uh, to your users with pretty much an open, we don't, we don't really understand your world, let us in. Uh, generally, they will do, as long as you're asking open questions and, and helping them feel involved and not putting any mandate, I think, especially within the fishing industry about what you want this to achieve for them, but letting them help that develop that with you. Um, and then, so that was our first week of, well, our first kind of two days of research in context. Um, Charlie and I then took all of those findings away and developed an understanding of what we wanted to take through co-design. So is anyone, is, is everyone here familiar with what co-design is? Um, it's just, it might be a, in our case, it was a two-hour workshop uh, with this motley crew of fishermen um, and a marine electronics supplier who might be the conduit through which this product actually gets sold. Um, we actually ran this co-design session um, the day that the mega storm hit and got stuck together um, in Brixham. Um, but it meant facilitating this co-design session with these, with these lovely gentlemen who were quite hesitant to come in the first place. It took a lot of prying. It took the promise of, um, it took the promise of, of a lunch voucher uh, and also... Um, yeah, just time and patience to get them involved. And you can see their enthusiasm that they were really thrilled to be there. Um, but in the end, it, and it was a slow, slow process of getting them warmed up to the fact. And we actually spent a good five minutes just um, letting them get stuff off their chest. So I think, especially in an industry where people have so many gripes, they're really fed up. Regulation of the regulation, we just took five minutes to, to basically say, like, just tell us what, just get it all out. Let's just get it all out so we have an even playing field to just play with this technology, understand how it could be built together, and then kind of test it with them. So we structured the co-design session kind of like in what we called an adventure book. So Dan was our mock fisherman, um, and we were like, how would Dan purchase uh, Pisces? Or um, how would Dan... Uh, yeah, what would the control uh, mechanism look like to actually run Pisces on a boat? And by taking people kind of through this adventure book where we would close one chapter and open the other, we actually started to build up how a service could be developed around this particular product. Um, this is Dan futzing with uh, positioning about where the product should go in a net with a fisherman. And I just wonder, Dan, if you want to feedback on what co-design meant for you as somebody, as a product designer working in this, working in this way. So as you can see, it was so stressful that my beard fell off. Um, it's, uh, it's never come back. But uh, it, was, it was really good. I mean, we had, a lot, we had a lot of challenging conditions, like the snowstorm and people being unable to actually reach the venue to, to come and work with us, and us I, unable to leave afterwards. Um, but having all the things in the room and being able to ask very direct questions that people with such deep knowledge of, of the fishing industry, um, the guy you saw on the previous slide, the young tall guy, Tom, just has this encyclopedic knowledge of everything. It's his life. And so he could show us all the things immediately and with great confidence that we were asking questions about and make suggestions that were rooted in his own personal experience that would have taken that we would never have got to ourselves. Like we're not fishermen, um, we're all engineers. So to have that straight from him was, was amazing. And the rest of the guys as well for their own inputs. Um, and it, it just made a huge difference to get that immediate and confident feedback for us and, and show things in context. Um, also challenge our own assumptions more than anything. Yeah, and this is how we facilitated it. We asked a question, so what kind of control system would work for you as a fisherman and why? And then we had a series of prompts that we kind of facilitated discussions around. So choose what type of control system would be best for you and why, whether that be a remote control system um, that can be used anywhere on a boat or a control system that's installed in the wheelhouse, which is the tiny area of the boat where people, where fishermen actually steer and direct where the boat should go to catch the right fish, or a control system that can be used anywhere by multiple people, perhaps on an app. And through these prompts and dialogue, we actually started to drill down with fishermen about how they would want this to be used and the mechanisms through which they did that. And through that, we actually started to prototype um, what a control center might look like, what a monitor might look like, so they could see how the devices are working when they're actually out in the ocean 
um, supporting them to catch the right fish. What support services would they need? Do they want a direct phone number to uh, Wilf, the marine electronics guy, to be like, my Pisces device isn't working, or should that call go to, go to Dan? Um, your profile, like fishermen are actually equally collaborative as they are territorial. What information do they want to share with other, other fishermen about how their prices are working? I think a key question that we ask is, do we want to make this programmable for a fisherman themselves or have it already programmed so they just press a button and it's like, we don't want to catch halibut, we want to catch hake. And that was quite a, a round table discussion about what functionality we wanted to provide to fishermen. And I think we landed on the idea as an, an, an emerging technology that it's something that we should just offer them as pre-programs um, to enable to build up that confidence that it would help them do what they want to do. And then build out a kind of development strategy that would enable fishermen, once they were familiar with the technology, to actually start manipulating manipulating it and playing with it that would, might provide the data for SN Tech to actually further develop the technology. Um, so we made these kind of live, live prototypes, um, which uh, are the interfaces that we are showing here, um, including the language that was used, um, the kind of roles that people have. Um, fishermen love their boats. Uh, they love talking about their boats. Whenever you go into a fisherman's office, their walls are covered in their boats. So uh, you know, that means that having a, their boat on the app would probably be really important, and this boat was named after me. Um, and basically just a hotline and a helpline, which I think really put the perspective for SN Tech about what additional support services would have to be kind of developed and involved to actually launch this product. What's the level of confidence a fisherman needs um, in order to know that when they throw their net out with 10 Pisces attached to it, that it, they're actually going to land what they want to land when they get it back. Um, so we took this prototype back out into the community, um, and again, it was a slow turn of getting fishermen and the appetite that they, that they wanted to, to actually just spend time with us testing something. Oh, no, I'm not really interested in that, or like, what are you talking about? Um, like, blank face. And then it would be a process of, of working through it with them, and, and sure enough, once you build a rapport, they will talk your ears off about what they think about fishing and what they think about light. And I think for me, the, the, the real nub of this project is how quickly you can form relationships with people when you're doing design right. And I think that is what we want to share with you today in um, the way that we do design at Snook and the way that we like to do design with our clients, which is come along with us, let's learn together. Um, this isn't about us doing it and then walking away, but actually building services and products um, together with the people that are going to use them. So that meant going into going onto boats, um, attempting not to get sick, um, but very quickly learning that a interface as we designed is probably not actually going to be very workable or very feasible in a boat. Um, fishermen, the life of a fisherman is, is quite like filthy. Um, it's oily, it is uh, full of gasoline, it is very fishy, obviously, um, but also the boat sways. So if you, if you imagine that you're uh, trying to program something to get your Pisces, de Pisces device working, a uh, touch interface might not actually work very well. Um, so a lot of people said, well, why can't I just download this software onto my existing monitors? Because as you see, a wheelhouse is full of monitors, whether that be monitoring the depth of the ocean or um, the pass in which they go to. Um, they already have some pretty extensive tech already in these wheelhouses, so let me just download it onto my existing monitor. I don't want another monitor. To be frank, I don't even have enough room for another monitor. Um, and all of this stuff we immediately kind of fed back to Dan, and I think we're going to reflect a little bit on how this project has enabled uh, SN Tech to kind of further develop the technology. Um, and so kind of a culmination of this project was really building service principles around a physical product um, and something that we really championed and something that is echoing through SNTech's continued development is Pisces is built by fishermen for fishermen. And we kind of put a, a, a stake in the ground saying this technology is only going to succeed if you continually develop with the people that are going to use it. Um, I think the fishing industry especially, and this goes, like that rule goes above across every industry, right? But I think it's especially, especially pertinent in the fishing industry because it's so risk averse, because the rules in which they're governed and restricted to do things are quite severe. Um, 
policy restrictions, uh, what they can and can't catch. So it's got to be led by fishermen, or it's simply not going to work. Um, this idea of building in product flexibility for market readiness, um, developing Pisces incrementally. So as it's developed here, and you can probably feed back on this better than I can, Dan, this might only attach to certain, certain types of nets, but what are the types of nets that we could uh, get it out into the market quickly, get money in to then re-spur the development for other types of nets. There are how many different types of fishing nets? Right. There's like more than I can imagine. And actually adapting this technology for use above and beyond those means that you have to kind of build in this flexibility over time. Um, position the technology one step ahead of policy. And again, I think this is really important for an industry such as fishing, which is completely dictated by policy. You can't catch this fish for two weeks Basically, when we were in Brixen, there was a bass ban, but the problem that fishermen are having, which is why this technology is so important and so vital, is they, they basically said, well, we can't stop a, a bass coming into our net. Um, so they're actually catching tons and tons of bass and then just having to throw them away because legally they're not allowed to land them. Um, that means uh, it's detrimental for them because they're not making any money. It's pretty de detrimental for uh, sustainable fishing because you're just throwing dead fish back into the sea. Um, and we think that this technology can actually be, be positioned to be ahead of policy to kind of dictate what might be changing and what might, what might, be, um, what might be motivated to change and actually, yeah, just step one, one step ahead of that, which is quite exciting. Um, crack the UK market first. This is one of my favorite fishermen that we met. Um, he was actually like, I'm sorry, that device isn't going to work on my net because it was a beam trawler, which kind of sits at the bottom of the ocean and get, it gets dragged along. Is that right? Um, and so obviously that won't work because that will just get dragged along. And get, but he gave us a lot of feedback about, um, about, about what he thought and how he thought this would be relevant to the UK market. And I think there are lots of ideas about where this could go globally, and we'll touch on that a bit later, but um, we have a captive audience here in the UK, and I think this is what this project did. It, it created a captive audience. It created people that wanted to use it and test it and continually co-develop it with Dan and his team. Um, so let's focus here first and then think about going to Indonesia later. Um, and then this idea of p building Pisces of, as its own brand, so separating it from SN Tech and just building it as, yeah, as its own brand, having its own logo, having its own website, all of which we prototyped within this process as well, um, together with fishermen. And this kind of echoed through about their confusion about going to the SN Tech website and being like, well, I don't really understand how this product fits into your business. And, and it's like, okay, well, let's just separate it out. And that makes it a lot easier for you guys. So we came up with a product development strategy, um, which basically meant that the core functionality of this device could be retrofitted into different, um, whether that be a flotation device or um, uh, another device to actually attach it to those different types of nets, um, which actually meant that we could come up with a product development uh, life cycle and pipeline off of this very, very short sprint of research. Like I said, we only did research probably over a month um, in three different sprints. Um, we also developed a service blueprint, um, which meant that it works as a guide for SN Tech and um, to understand how this product kind of develops over time um, and what they might need uh, to incorporate into their business model in order to, to facilitate this development. Um, and basically uh, how a fisherman would join the Pisces, kind of join as in buy the Pisces product, um, how they would receive it. Does it come in a box? Where does it get mailed to? Um, how do they install it? Uh, again, this is where the monitors kind of comes down rather than a specific app that they might install. And then how do they use it and how does the data they, they collect actually come back to SN Tech in order them, for the company to continually uh, iterate on the design. And we planned and developed a roadmap for um, future Pisces development. So this iterative cycle of research, development, deploy, learn, research, development, deploy, learn. So all of this was um, kind of developed off of this project and given to SN Tech as part of, as part of this. Um, and importantly, I think we also developed a service model, um, which meant just not looking at it as a product, but a product as a service. And I think that's where this, 
this project really hit a, a highlight for me is actually, um, it's all very fine to uh, have developed products, but um, if, if Dan was just to launch this into the world without necessarily doing some of the user research that we did in this, it probably would have been quite risky to your development um, in the sense that um, our project uh, actually outlines some of the key points in which fishermen would have to be involved in this and the way in which the business should run to facilitate that. Um, so oh, we also uh, define some principles to kind of guide decision making as Pisces develops. Um, and these are just like posters and snippets of information for Dan and his team to kind of remember as they continually develop this product, um, which is just a nice little add-on. Um, so I guess what I just wanted to spend a little bit of time doing, because I actually haven't caught up with Dan properly since finishing this project, is just ask you what from the result of this. Um, how have you guys used it and where are you now in terms of, uh, in terms of this project? Sure. Um, <laughs> so where are we? We are continuing in product development, hardware design. We've just finished our first batch of these that have been sent off the trials around the world. Um, we haven't had a chance to fully implement all of this learning yet. Uh, it's definitely taking a role in, in the future work that we're doing around the sort of market stuff that we're doing. How do we actually sell this? How do we get it out there through routes to different people? Where are we starting? Where will it go in the future and why? And how do we make the case for it? Um, yeah, so a lot of scientific development, a lot of product focus at the moment. Um, but yeah, it's, uh, it's been very useful in terms of consolidating a lot of the business stuff that we're doing. Like this summer, we're going to be doing two months of really focused strategy work. And this will play very heavily into that thinking so that we know that we've got this basis of understanding with at least our first market um, so that we can, we can start to put that in there. We don't have to go and do it all again, which is great because it's really thorough and we're still using bits and pieces from it. Um, and I'm sure it will continue to inform us in the future. Hi, so just wondering about um, what kind of research was done with the product um, when you're developing that product as opposed to research um, done during the project. Um, kind of, had you researched with um, fishermen, kind of the end users as it were, um, before? Um, and how did you come up with the idea for, um, for that product as opposed to kind of the more service design aspects of it? Sure. I might need the micro for that unless. Oh, okay. Thanks. You can share. Cool. Just, yeah, that works. Um, so this started, um, this started, like I said, like eight years ago, right? Um, when I was a final year student on a product design and engineering course up in Glasgow. Um, so my background is in product design uh, and, and sort of user-centered design as well. I spent five years doing this in the space industry. So this has been going out with fishermen on fishing vessels, speaking to scientists, speaking to policymakers, trying to get the understanding of where something like this could fit into that space. Um, so it started from there, and it was really quite intensive with that research, but then over the last few years, we've focused so much on making this thing a reality with the technology, getting something that can go a kilometre under the ocean for a cheap enough price that can do the sort of scientific stuff that you need to do, that we've kind of drifted away from the human element so much. It's like, we sort of know where we've started, let's build a thing we can test and then go and validate that. And so this was a real chance for us to dive headlong back into that, and, and not only for for us to take a step away and be like, we need to actually be challenged on this rather than trying to finish people's sentences because we're like, oh no, we thought of that. Um, we needed to hear from an impartial third party that where we completely missed the point, and that was pointed out a few times, um, where we got it sort of right and we could, we could sort of prove our assumptions and say, okay, that's great, good fundamentals, um, and really what to develop next. And that's what this has done in, in, incredibly well, I have to say, like, uh, we learned a lot from this process about where we needed to make some steps. Um, and, and then re-engaging with that audience has been a great new platform to go back and say, we have faith that this is a, a good thing that we've done. So then we can go and have those further conversations. Hi. Um, what made you choose the methods for the UX that you did? Because you use a variety of different things. What made you choose those ones? So the going to the pipes, <coughs> the, that stuff. What was the what was the research behind it? Yeah, I mean, we started our um, our research phase with um, just phone interviews with uh, 
not just fishermen, with players across the system, so food processors, retailers, uh, and through that we found advocates um, within the communities that we uh, decided that we were going to research in. And it was working with those advocates that knew the individuals within the communities that we, that we built up a picture of the best way in which we would do the research. So, and that was, that was a godsend, really, in finding those individuals and taking the time to meet with them, have phone calls with them to actually say, because we, we watched them being like, oh, we're, well, so we'll do research with Fisher people, because we thought it would be a little bit more PC. But actually, um, we were told like pretty, pretty outright that if we were to do that, it would actually alienate the very types of people that we, that we wanted to engage with, because it wasn't language that they used or they understood. Um, so I think that, that point of working with the right people within the communities to help you design your research phases was really crucial here. Because I think if we just waltzed in with like, we wouldn't have known to go to Tides, which was the preferred breakfast joint of choice for fishermen. We probably would have ended up with the one on the other side of the, of the town. Um, and getting those little tidbits and then responding to them. And, and I think having a little bit of gusto, because it's quite intimidating, to be honest, to just go in somewhere and like turn around and be like, oh, you're a fisherman, do you want to have a chat? Because generally they're like, no. Um, <laughs> but, they even say that. Yeah, <laughs> um, but I think it's, it's saying, oh, yeah, we spoke to Jim Masters, and he told, he told us, and, they, and they're like, oh, yeah, I know Jim, and I trust him. And, it, and so using those individuals to build trust before you even get there, I think is why we succeeded in this project. Um, and something that I kind of hold with me now in, in terms of every other project that I do, like who is the key advocate that I can have a conversation with me that's gonna help me get to know this community like that? Because I don't really have time to wait. <laughs> and that worked really well here. I came down to Brixham for the second session um, after you guys have been down there before, right, to meet people. So I came down and already, maybe two or three weeks later or a month later, um, we were going around places and people were like, oh yeah, you're the light project people, or you're, you're the people who are like going around doing this stuff. So yeah, they did an amazing job of just like, everyone knew who you were. Yeah. Hi, thanks so much. Uh, thanks so much. I think it's great to see also like the client service uh, provider combo on stage as well, it's, uh, it's really inspiring to see. Um, I guess my question kind of relates back to the, the previous talk as well about, it sounds like your products could be super um, disruptive to, or, you know, could take, to, could take fishing to a new place, I guess, in terms of how they decide how to, how to do their jobs and how to, how to run their businesses. So in that sense, going back to this kind of timeline of kind of function through ritual and, and myth that we heard about, some of the kind of you know, big uh, disruptors of the 20th century, like cars, you know, started very functional and uh, maybe they've become more, um, well, so they started very mythical and became more functional. It sounds like what you're saying is by actually understanding some of these rituals and these myths of how people already live their lives and, and do their kind of, fulfill their tasks and what that means to them as individuals, you're able to uh, create a better functional product. Yeah, absolutely. I, I, mean, I think um, part of our research became less about the product and very much more about the people and, um, you know, thinking about how this thing would get charged and actually, oh, no, I wouldn't charge it on the boat, I'd just charge it in my home. And then if you want to, you know, come see what that might look like. And, and, I, and I think it is, it is about, um, especially, especially with fishermen and in the context of, of the industry where it's, it's incredibly tight tighten it and whispers spread really, really fast. And, and, and I think um, it becomes a delicate practice of respecting that and respecting their own rituals that they might have around the practice of fishing uh, and really working to understand how this fits within those but then might be disruptive. Um, I don't think fishermen are looking for disruption, um, but I might be wrong with that, but they want that all they want to do is catch more fish so they can feed their family uh, and not throw fish away that, you know, somebody compared the bass ban and throwing tons of fish away to, that's my mortgage going down the drain. And I think when you make it quite, when you, when you just listen to the personal aspects, irregardless of the product that we're trying to build, then it, it becomes a lot more human and it becomes a human-centered product. Um, so I hope that answered your question, but you might have a couple more reflections on that. Yeah, I think that's just yeah. 
Okay, because the time we're going to have to close the event here, and we'll just leave at about nine o'clock. Can we thank?